I have a confession to make. I suck at maths. All right, fair enough. Here's why that may give you a slightly awkward feeling. I've got a PhD in physics. Getting there was quite the journey. Hi, my name's Alex. I've argued enough for a lifetime. Put your headphones on, sit back, relax, and enjoy your commute or whatever else you're really doing right now. Good night to those of you who use my content to fall asleep. <laughs> in addition, please share and like or give a thumbs up or do whatever one does on the platform you use to consume content like this. Doing so will help me a lot. Thank you. Imagine yourself a freshman at university taking courses in engineering management. High school is still well within memory, of course, and you find out that you are the only student who is younger than 30 years of age. It took me longer than I care to admit to realize that I would be better off doing something else. I decided to do so. Fine, but what to do? I'd been successful at high school with the following thought. I'll major in physics and math. That's what I don't know how to do, so I can learn the most. I repeated that line of thought after deciding to quit what I considered to be a geriatric class of elders. At the time, I'm older now than most of them were then. The point is, I started studying physics. Goes to show how stupid logic can be sometimes. See, when I showed up in Tübingen in Germany to study physics, I ended up being the only one in my class without a study group at the end of the first semester. As Kevin, which is not his real name, told me once, you don't fit here either, as I want to add almost automatically. I wasn't enough of a genius, I guess. Still, I decided to give it a shot. After all, how often was I going to change studies? And to boot, I was interested in how nature worked. I did want to learn. I just wasn't very good at physics and maths. And I felt that that wasn't an excuse to stop. Still, I needed something to keep me going during those <coughs> dark years. Enter 42 the amazingly accurate answer to life, the universe, and everything. I can't say that I know everything. What little I know about life, I try to use as well as possible to make every day count. The universe, though. I could at least attempt to get a hold of the universe. And yes, there was a bit of subconscious hubris in that thought. Here is how we, as of today, think the universe works. In the beginning, there was I don't know what. As the universe came to be, it expanded rather faster than anything you could ever imagine. It didn't bang though. The radiation expanded and cooled, as the saying goes, and no, that's not a proper sentence semantically, but one that stuck in my head from a Melody Sheep song. When things cool, stuff happens. Mostly we know this from, for example, water becoming ice, but it's just as applicable to things like radiation turning into matter, because things aren't quite as hot as they used to be. With time, lots of time, things cool down enough for matter to not just exist, but bond into something like the universe we see today. There's a lot of science and story, I might add, bound up in this, and I would very much like for you to read as much about it as possible. It's all a bit weird, to be honest. Scientists check what may be false, and need reasons to think something may be true. The Big Bang Theory predicts the so-called redshift. We found the redshift. It also predicts something called cosmic background radiation, and we found that too. But then, of course, there is dark matter and dark energy. Exploring dark energy and what it may or may not be, I found myself confronted with, of all things, particle physics. If you want to know where stuff comes from, you always end up with particle physics. That would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that we talk particle physics. You know, as I progressed through university, undisturbed by the naysayers, there was just so much that was just so weird that I went from being interested to being intrigued. I mean, you know what I mean, right? For example, you've already heard about empty atoms before, Rutherford's experiment and all. But even though we're factually mostly empty space, nobody can look through us. What's more, we touch things all the time. Quantum reflection makes it possible. Do you know what image forces are? They are quite literally what you feel. They are tangible. When I sat there one night, reading until the morning dawned, I was happy. Past my bachelor degree even, there had been an underlying feeling of dread. I thought that I might have screwed up again. Not after this night, though. After this night, I knew I was going to be a physicist. Honestly, how could I not want to be?
If empty matter isn't enough for you, just think about what is called the double slit experiment. Childish innuendo in that name aside, this is a manifestation of about the most weirdly awesome piece of reality in existence. Depending on how you set it up, particles moving through a wall with slits in can behave either as a wave or as a little ball of sorts or get this both and or neither. Talk about screwing with people's minds. This means simply that we become somewhat helpless when confronted with the microscopic world. Imagination surrenders and yet, as it turns out, we can find nothing less than how it all fits together this way. Particle physics is about the 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature and the Higgs boson. These explain the whole world as we know it. Well, they don't, and I knew they didn't, but what occupied my mind mostly was how humongously unintuitive all of it was. Just take the word particle. It describes one thing in the real world. You know, the kind of thing that you hoover up. In physics, a particle is determined by its wave function, which, when taken to the square, gives us a probability density. Probability for what, though? Well, books have an answer, which is almost not quite true. There's a lot of uncertainty, as it were. Anyway, at that point, I was lucky to meet him who should become my supervisor later. He said, do the maths and shut up. Gee, thanks for that inspiration, right? Well, at least temporarily, it's exactly what you're supposed to do. Build up experience and take it from there to deeper understanding. With training comes knowledge. With knowledge comes awesomeness. After all, we can build x-ray machines, smartphone screens and whatnot with the help of particle physics. You knew that probably. Here, I can take it up a notch. The most advanced quantum theory with experiments backing it up at this point in time is QED. I'm not even kidding. Quantum electrodynamics combines quantum mechanics with special relativity. If that sentence didn't make sense to you, think parts of Einstein made weirder. As you would suspect, you can represent QED by means of stick figures. They're called Feynman diagrams. And they're just that, stick figures. Modern physics in one sentence. Mighty stick figures I sacrifice at your altar. At any rate, the only alternative to those stick figures really is a sort of one equation to rule them all. And you can find both Feynman diagrams as well as the standard model equation online, about as easily as images of apples falling on Newton's head. And if you do search and find, you more likely than not end up asking yourself how in the world humans deal with stuff like this. The answer lies in symmetries, that is, physical or mathematical features of a system, observed or intrinsic, which remain unchanged under some transformation of the system. Here's about as much as I can write about that. Equations like the standard model equation describe physical systems. If a physical quantity, something, anything really, stays the same under a given set of cases, we may call it a symmetry for the given set of cases within a given physical system. If you remember your school physics, then the total energy would be a symmetry for the given set of school physics cases. When that isn't quite what you observe, the symmetry is broken and you have to dig a little deeper. And that is a piece for another day. When confronted with an insane equation, we look for symmetries within the framework of the physical reality the equation describes. Using these, we can normally assume weird stuff, which makes the equation easier to handle, and we find out things like this. Atoms are made of quarks. We predict, we prove. End of a usually rather long story. Don't arrest me on the word equation, by the way. I'm too lazy to say non-linear system of oodles of coupled partial differential equations, which is what nature mostly requires and what that standard model equation really is. No, I'll happily call it an equation. It's enough that I hid in the closet crying for a week or two when first confronted with QED. You don't have to relive that part. It wasn't pretty, but I plowed on. Stuff that isn't made of quarks is called leptons. Those are electrons and a host of other point particles, that is, we safely assume them to not have any physical extension. Good. Now what in the world would a point particle even be, in point as opposed to what? You know, like I said a minute ago, the only spatial extension in atoms and things that make any sense are space-related probabilities. MT, Rutherfordian atoms and all that. Pointing out that point particles are to be treated like points seems pointless. It isn't. And yes, I have stopped crying since. Anyway, it turns out that quarks and leptons make up matter. They interact by means of those four forces of nature, each of which has a so-called gauge boson connected to them. 
Gauge bosons are imaginary particles existing only for the shortest of times. The one for gravity, the graviton, needs a couple of extra spatial dimensions to be feasible as an idea, much less existing. Yes, I just said that. Perhaps I have started crying again too, and stopped again. There's no point, you know. Either you're a physicist or you aren't. I'm a physicist. Simple as that. Speaking about those forces of nature, they're quite the bunch. They listen to names like weak and strong force as well as electromagnetic and gravitational force. We know a bit about the first three by means of a wonderfully absurd structure called quantum physics, of which particle physics is an aspect. General relativity deals with the fourth one, you can read all about them for yourself, but what struck my fancy as a student was just how desperate experimentalists seemed to want to get to high enough energies to test the idea of uniting the forces. See, we know that at high enough energies, say towards the beginning of the universe, the weak and electromagnetic forces essentially are the same thing. There are strong indications that at even higher energies, the electro-weak magnetic force, or whatever it is called, will unify with the strong force and then eventually we would talk about gravity as well. I will happily admit that my studies drifted into other things at this point. I was still doing physics and still staying interested, but you know, there was a threshold over which I didn't want to go. My specialization would become atmosphere physics, more or less because particle physics had made me cry and rejoice at the same time. There may be hardier people than me out there, and there are, but I couldn't continue with it. I mean, do you have any idea just how much more advanced theory is compared to experimentation in particle physics? No? Well, let's talk about just how we experiment on things like this, shall we? What does it really mean to reach higher energies? Well, the way we try to experiment on the weird ideas of particle physics is by means of some of the greatest machines ever built. Of course, I talk about particle accelerators. These are basically super long tubes. We smash protons against each other inside them at different speeds. In terms of energy, we do get rather close to the Big Bang even. We were able to create the Higgs boson after all, for example. So now you know that too. The problem is we don't get close enough. Thus, we can only test whether the weak and electromagnetic forces belong together. And they do. That's about it. I'd be stupid not to think that we won't find better ways in the future, but at the moment, that's it. That's what we can test. Not to be deterred by this reality, there's a bunch of idealists pursuing the ultimate knowledge by means of pure mathematics. Make the maths work, and you'll likely find out how nature works is the reasoning. Thus, string theories and humans being flatlanders. Not that I expect that you would have, but if you ever wondered how something can be both admirable and masturbatory at the same time, the original string theory and its derivatives are it. Honestly, in a thousand years, string theorists may be heralded like we do the likes of Einstein and Newton today. Visionaries who lived well before the time was ripe for their ideas. As it is, I'm not even sure that there are any testable predictions connected to the string theories. Truth be told, the term mathematical masturbation does resonate in my mind here. For one thing, 11 dimensions of space-time are required chew on that, as they say in Norway. The point is this. Physics is weird, then it's all weird. The New York City sewer system or the blueprints to a car engine aren't exactly intuitive either. Nevertheless, they work to varying degrees of efficacy. The efficacy of physics in underpinning and constructing a foundation onto which we build and develop isn't low. It starts with basic research of nature and ends in x-ray machines at your local dentist. I for one revel in the wonders of nature per se. But for many of my students, it's what humans have been able to extract from the laws describing nature that keeps them going. 
Modern medicine prolongs life to a point which must seem incredible to people from even only a century ago. We are close enough to understanding the universe for many of the most well-trained scientists in the world to pursue what may very well end up being a pipe dream in searching for the theory of everything. Still, most of the actual work you understand is tedious, dull and not in itself inspiring. Rather, it deals with running against the same walls repeatedly, not knowing whether a breakthrough awaits or not. When the going gets tough, you need something to keep you going. I won't speak for others, of course, but to me it is this. It ain't intuitive, it's weird, it's impossible for me to stop learning. See, I've grown into and out of academia, but never out of curiosity and a childish glee for discovery. So yes, I suck at maths. I was told that I didn't fit with physicists. Was it really any wonder that I got myself that science PhD? No, I don't think so either. If anything, science has, difficult, tedious and yes, weird as it can be, opened my eyes to the joy of learning. And that, strangely, has led me down a rather remarkable professional path in life. If you want to, search for the terms science, leadership, empathy and story next to my name and see what comes up. Thanks for staying with me to the end. Join me on socials and YouTube or check out kindnessthroughknowledge.com to book a presentation. See you next time. <music>